Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we've got an Englishman in Paris joining us on the show very shortly, so we can't wait to have a chat with him and see how he's getting on. But from an Englishman in Paris to a Scotsman in Hossegor, how's your week, Johnny? How you doing? It's been good. It's been good so far. I think about it's about to take an ugly turn. Um, started off well Sunday again covered La Rochelle Toulon which was great but now we're dodging the winter vomiting virus as I think everyone is um it was 30 degrees here today mate but everyone's winter, got it oh, <laughs> exactly that was ridiculous but the winter vomiting bug uh it's been kicked off by everyone sweating too much in 30 degrees um a pile of kids are home our middle kid Cora came home giving it the I feel sick so she's currently up hugging a bucket on the couch oh. watching some Frozen, so I'm waiting for the impending doom and the redecoration of the house and that sort of brown-orange colour that you spend on your hands and knees <laughs> mopping up for the next few days. Um, and if you see me looking slim over autumn, you know why. Um, but yeah, just waiting for that to kick in. But otherwise, good mate, all well and healthy for the minute. Um, and you, mate, you've been saying that you've been under the weather as well. Just too many late nights covering the Women's World Cup or what's been happening? I think so. Lack of sleep and a diet of nothing but sandwiches is not going to be good for anyone, is it? And chips. There's always yeah. chips. Through the night in Ealing. Some good games. but Awesome games. Yeah, none, none more so than England-France, which was a cracker. A cracker. But yeah, I wish I was on the same time zone as them. <laughs> I think everyone does, mate. It is well, it's been awesome. To, it's been great to catch up, as even the ones that we haven't seen live, the catch up and the viewership they've had. Um, I think ITV got nearly 900,000 in a peak. Um, for their biggest That's game right. for the England game. So like, it's amazing that the numbers that are tuning in and watching and engaging with it, um, it's fantastic. So even if it's not live, highlights afterwards, you're obviously doing a great job on your side of the your job. <laughs> Thanks very well much. Done. It's all down to you. <laughs> uh, well, we will keep you on the podcast as long as possible because clearly you don't want to go and clear up sick. So we should chat no, some 100%. French rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Before we bring our guest in, we should have a quick chat about the week in French rugby. Never oh, yeah. dull. <laughs> Plenty to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start with the positives. Fabian Galtier has named his 42-man squad for the Autumn Nation series. So mm-hmm. what do you make of it? Any surprises? Well, I think as expected, generally, a couple of surprises because it's on a large squad. There's 42 men, as you mentioned. So uh, Raka back in after terrorizing defenses over the past seven rounds of Clermont. Pablo, Pablo Iberti from Bordeaux. He's been back in form and causing havoc as well for, for Bordeaux. Um a new one that not many people will know is Ethan Dumortier. He scored two tries against Montpellier this weekend. It was excellent all round. He's part of the crop that won the under 20s World Cup in 2019. He came off the bench then. Um, but a winger looks like a, a massive future ahead of him. Thomas Laclayette, the tight head from Oyonnax. He's the only yeah. Cordy Do player. Alexandre Beconnier, the Montpellier back row, who's been in and out. Will he get more game time? We don't know. Leo Berdeau, the standoff. Uh, from Lyon as well, who's part of that big win at Montpellier for Lyon. Um, probably going to be third choice by an Intermac and Jalibert, but, you know, he's fought off some fairly big names to get there. Um, Red Awardy from La Rochelle, the Lucid, big aggressive, scrummaging, ball carrying, bashing Lucid, who's decent as well, and Jordan Joseph, probably the other wild card. So there's maybe seven or eight names um, that maybe people don't know too much about, but the rest of the squad settles as you would expect. But are any of them going to be bolters and get real game time? We'll wait and see, but the squad right now looks settled um, and fairly comfortable. I was going to say, we'll chat about it a bit more nearer the time, but with a squad that big, the names like Leclerc, Birdo, are they going to get any game time or are they there for for experience? Do you think we'll see quite a settled side throughout all of the games for France? Well, I don't know. I got at 10, for instance, you've got Intermac, who's named. He's obviously carrying an ankle injury. You've got um, Jalibert as well, who's been out with injuries. Well, so you don't know at what time these guys are going to come back to fitness. It's a real opportunity even for Berdo to go in and train properly, effectively, and drive training and show what he can do leading in a 10 jersey through the training session. So there's a chance he might get some game time. The other names, Joseph, probably less likely, Laclaia, less likely from Pro Do, but it's a 42 man squad because the intensity of the training they get through and the numbers required are absolutely massive. So um, it is a big old squad. Are some of those fringe guys going to get game time? I think that'll come down to injuries and availability nearer the, the test matches when they're announced. Um, but look, they'll be absolutely delighted again to be involved, stick their hand up, be part of the squad, be in front of Fabian Galtier, as we always are, to just to be in front of an international coach because they know what you can offer. And therefore, with one year to the World Cup, 
you're able to show what you can do in front of that coaching staff. So um, maybe not too much change in evolution, but still a big opportunity just to be there for some of those guys, strangely. Okay, on to the negatives. And yeah. Breathe. So they lost 45-7 at home to, to lose. That can happen. But that's led to Jeremy Davidson losing his job. So yeah. we've chatted a bit about them in recent weeks. Is this decision linked to the new investment they've got coming in and increased expectation already or, or what's happened? It's a, well, it, it's a strange one and it isn't because Jeremy Davidson had just signed an extension to 2024, 2025, I think. So a big contract extension for him and largely across the last two, three, four, five seasons, he's done a really good job with Brief. Um, but that game, I'm not sure if that game has just been the straw that's broke the camel's back, but they look totally outclassed and bereft of ideas. And I'm not sure for the new ownership or for whoever is the custodian of the club now, if they said, right, if we're going to make a change, it needs to be now. Um, they've announced two supplementary players that are going to sign during the week. But it isn't going to be easy. Like, you have stability and a structure behind the scenes. With Jeremy going now, that makes it more difficult. You've got to scramble midway through the season to get yourself together, find a way of playing and... Um, and find a different way of playing it really quickly. You've got Arno Mella that's in charge. Arno Mella was coaching at Albi two seasons ago in Federal One. Um, he hasn't had much management experience at the top level. So it's now a massive task for him. It's not like you're bringing in a really experienced head coach or somebody with a big reputation or somebody that can give you a quick fix. It's untested as well. So it is the nature of the beast. It's disappointing for Jeremy Davidson, who is widely, largely respected for the job he's done with Breve. Um, my worry for them now is when you go into this relegation battle, and don't get me wrong, it's already started between Bayon, Breve, Perpignan, and Poe, is you now lose two more games and you're gone. Like your confidence is shot and you're completely gone. So they need something, a shot in the arm really quickly, an injection of different ideas and ingenuity and confidence that needs to come quickly. And is that going to come from Arno Mella? I'm not quite sure. Um, but the question really is now, can they keep the club in the top 14? before this investment arrives. Because if they go down to Pro De Deux, it's another rebuild. It's a starting from scratch and it becomes even more difficult. And you mentioned the job Jeremy Davidson's done. I think he's been there four years, took them up from Pro De Deux. He's kept them in the top 14 and, and they've yep. largely been competitive over, over the last couple of years. So you shouldn't be underestimated how big a job that is. Other people wouldn't have been able to achieve those things. No, not at all. And look, he did the same thing with Aurillac and Pro De Deux previously. It wasn't glamorous rugby, but it was winning rugby. They won their home games. They managed to pick off a few opponents on the road um, and they just find a way of getting things done. But I think for him, unfortunately, it's just been the manner of that defeat. Um, he's been given the boot effectively straight after the final whistle, um, which is never nice to go through. And there was meetings going on through the game. Apparently, that has been in the French press, meetings through the game to say, look, this can't go on. We need yeah. to change. Um, and so it's disappointing for him, disappointing for the club. Can they turn it around and, and change the way they're playing? I'm not sure. I think it's going to be really hard. Um, but for him on a personal level to have that go on and to be given the boot after kickoff or the day after um, must have been extremely hard as well. So disappointing for him, hard for Breve. Um, but I think it's going to get hard over the next few weeks to find a pattern of playing, find confidence and win some games quickly. You mentioned you were covering the Sunday night game between La Rochelle and Toulon. We spoke a bit about it last week and you said... It's always going to be tough to beat La Rochelle at home, clearly, but Toulon playing well, you could see potentially it happening. But La Rochelle had too much in the second half, didn't they? They were exceptional. Um, and that as well, given the team that Toulon went there with, with some real expectations, um, it was a war. Like the gain line war was, it was almost hard to watch at some bits, um, but carries by Skelton, Antonio, like Greg Aldra again. Greg was absolutely exceptional. They're just so hard to contain. And then defensively, they're so solid. Um, work by Raymond Rule, Jonathan Dante, they just shut out any time or space that Toulon had and they couldn't cope. Um, and as I said, they went there with a big team to try and turn La Rochelle over, but that was almost effectively a big marker laid down by La Rochelle to say, come here effectively at your peril um, because they were utterly dominant um, and they bludgeoned Toulon through the game. They had three tries, rolling malls, um, but throughout the game, whenever it got into multi-phase or phase play, uh, La Rochelle just absolutely bullied them. And the champions, Montpellier, they lost at home to Lyon, didn't they? Yeah, and I'd say that's the pick of the week's results. Going to the champions um, and turning them over convincingly was some result. Berdeau, he's been picked up in the, the French squad as a third-choice 10. He was excellent. Tofua was good, a run back in the team for him. 
Um, but globally, they looked hungry. Again, after me criticizing them last week and saying I didn't really know how they were trying to play, what they were trying to do, they went away from home and found a really big performance. Um, so really impressed by them. Uh, their back line as well, I thought was misfiring and didn't know what was happening, but came up with some really nice combinations, broke down the Montpellier defensive line, and time and time after again, got them on the back foot and converted their chances. So probably the result of the weekend um, for Leon, a massive result away from home. And another team that we said, probably needed a big win. Bordeaux at home to wrestling, they got one. Yeah, finally. And I think mentally, if not, <laughs> if nothing else, that's absolutely what they needed. Loads of criticism in the press for how they're playing, confidence, heads down. Christoph Furios being asked tough questions week in, week out in press conferences and getting a little bit tasty. And they just needed a win. Um, and one team that they seem to have had a lot of joy against over the past two, three seasons has been Racing. Um, they seem to have smashed them every time I can remember. They're playing, they've won away in Paris as well recently, a couple of times as well. Um, but a big result, they just ground Racing down. They didn't have enough to stop them. And Bordeaux finally, you know, six, seven games in, looking like the side that we've seen over the past two, three seasons. So a big win for them, but more importantly, a big mental stepping stone onto getting back on the horse. Let's get our guest on now then. And he's a man who swapped England for New York State and has now made Paris his home. Racing 92 winger, former NFL man, Wasps, England star, Christian Wade joins us. How you doing? Hey guys, how you doing? Um, really absolutely great right now. Um, we actually just finished our first big day of the week. So tomorrow's the day off, which most professionals will always look forward to. So, you know, I'm chilled right now. Good. And how is Paris treating you? And if you've got a day off tomorrow, what are your plans? Well, funny enough, although it's a day off, it's it's really just like a day off from, from the everyday schedule with rugby. Um, it's, it's still, I'm still going to be quite busy. I've actually got a few interviews I'm doing tomorrow um, and then just moved into a new house over here as well. So trying to organise furniture and, you know, um, going back to America to sort out my house over there to bring stuff over and shipping and stuff. So, you know, it's a day off from, you know, the mental side of things, you know, watching video or film, as they were saying in America. Um, but it obviously gives me the opportunity to um, do other stuff, which is obviously quite important. As you get older, you know, you have more responsibilities and stuff like that. So, Amen, yeah, Johnny. Good. As you get older. Amen. Eh? As we get older. <laughs> it happens to us all. It's an admin day. It's an admin day. That's what your wife would tell you. Um, I mean, you got married about a year ago. So was the move to Paris an easy sell? Was she up for moving to Paris? I mean, to be honest, uh, my wife's a model, influencer, and like, you know, media presenter so, so, uh, type of thing. So she, um, you know, she's, she's very open to um, new stuff. In terms of moving, you know, she was with me in London, or should I say in Coventry, um, you know, when I was with Wasps. And then when I obviously decided to retire and start, you know, getting ready for a big move, which obviously wasn't wasn't dead certain that would happen. Um, you know, I was kind of moving, bouncing around from hotels to hotels. You know, it was just quite a tough time as well. She was with me through that. And then um, went to Florida for like a four month camp to then try and get onto a team. Um, so, you know, moving around is something that we've been doing for the last five years. Um, so yeah, when obviously the opportunity came up to go to Paris, um, you know, I think she was a bit like, oh no, we're moving from New York, you know, somewhere where she's more familiar with. Um, we've been for the last four years. Um, but she, she was definitely up for the adventure and, you know, moving to Paris, which is, you know, another huge fashion capital, you know, there's opportunities there that we can open up for her career, um, as well as mine. So it's, it's something new for both of us. We're adjusting as, as well as we can. Um, but, uh, you know, everything's been going, going well so far, you know, and, uh, like you said, we got married. It's, it's this it's nearly a year, like it's on the 20, 21st or 22nd is our honeymoon. So <laughs> mate, don't forget that day. It's important, mate. It's the first one. <laughs> don't first forget one, up. especially. Yeah, I need to double check. I need to double check. <laughs> you know, we always, I've always got training as an excuse for how we do it the day after, babe, or, you know, the day before. 
You won't be short of places in Paris to find a present, I'm sure, Christian. You'll be fine. And so, mate, how did that move to racing come about? And look, you've already touched on so many points, Wasps, the NFL, like we'll try to unpack everything. But initially and most recently, the move to racing, because we saw you playing in a seven events there and then the contract was signed soon after. But how did it all happen? How did that pan out on the move back? So um, you probably saw it like the media and stuff. Um, after getting hurt in the NFL, um, they kept me on for the year. And then basically once I was fit and healthy or near enough and healthy, um, they had released me um, just at the beginning of like OTAs. In it was, would have been my fourth year over there. Um, so <clears throat> they released me after that. And, um, you know, I was looking at some other teams potentially going and, you know, doing some workouts and tryouts and stuff with other teams and stuff. But um, ultimately, I was I was looking at the options to go back into rugby. But from going from rugby, which, um, you know, is professional in its own right, to the NFL, you know, it's, it's a, million, a million miles apart. And um, it's not just because of the money, but... Is the you know just the way in the the culture, um, you know the I guess it's the mindset of of everybody, including coaches, staff, management, players across the board. Um, you know, coming back into rugby would be like not necessarily a backward step, but I didn't want it to be a backward step. So I was you know keen to look at going back into rugby, but I wanted to make sure I went somewhere where I could still you know, better myself as an athlete because that's all I ever care about anyway. You know, never really cared about money um, as long as I could pay the bills and take care of the family. But it's always been about trying to be the best I can be. Um, well, I keep, you say the best I can, I'm trying to be the best. Like I want to be the best at what I do. Um, and like I said, like I want to learn every day. I want to get better. And the NFL gave me that for three years, which is amazing. So coming back into rugby, you know, I felt like it. Um, there was a lot of years where I wasn't able to do that. And when I did kind of push for that, you know, I was blocked. And um, that's ultimately what pushed me to want to retire from the sport and try something else. So going back, I went, you know, opened my eyes up to a lot of new things. You know, I've experienced some stuff that, you know, no rugby player is ever going to experience unless they decide to make that move. So I see myself as, you know, set apart from everybody. Um, in a completely different way now. So I believe I have a lot to offer. And, um, you know, I wanted to go to a team that would uh, would understand that and a team that would also, um, you know, see the benefit in having me in the, in the locker room with the team and also being able to put performances out there on the field. So that was kind of a long answer. But ultimately, I was shopping around a little bit, you know, putting a couple of feelers out there. The media kind of caught wind of it um, through Van Dell. I think uh, Chris Ashton got his fault. Yeah, yeah. Chris, Chris Ashton got the record. So then obviously Van Dell um, was the former record holder for most tries in the premiership. Um, I was I was at third, now I'm fourth, I think. And ultimately Van Dell just said, oh, if Christian has anything to do with it, then Ashton won't be number one for much longer and so obviously when teams saw that I was doing media saying oh, I am interested in rugby people started putting two and two together so um, yeah I basically went around to a few different clubs um, in private type thing had a few conversations and uh, Racing was among those teams and um, you know ultimately I went down there they invited me over for seven days for a week did some training, had a look at the facilities. And um, I saw that they were playing in the um, the sevens tournament. And, um, you know, I had been lucky enough to play with players like Ollie Phillips and Dan Norton. And um, uh, I didn't actually play with Tom Biggs, but he was someone who I looked up to coming through playing on the sevens circuit, played against him in 15s and stuff. And um, they were coaching China 7. So I saw that as an opportunity for me to, while I was back home, to train with them, get some, you know, throw the ball about a little bit, see see if I still had the skills. Nah, I'm joking. I knew, <laughs> I, 
I know, I, I know I still had it, but I just wanted to, you know, get a feel for the ball. I hadn't watched rugby for, for about four or five years. And, um, yeah, like I said, fast forward to being at Racing, um, I was like, oh, it'd be cool to, like, you know, maybe play with the sevens team if you guys, you know, wanted some help and stuff. And, you know, they looked at it as an opportunity to have a look at me as well, see, see how I, uh, what my fitness levels are like and stuff. And, uh, you know, once we did that, next thing you know, um, you know, both both parties are happy. And I said, you know, if, if you guys would want me to be here, which ultimately they did, um, you know, we signed on the dotted line. So that's that's kind of how kind of how it came about. And presumably, like you said, you would have had other offers. Rassing, you've mapped out there why it's such an attractive proposition. Who who was it at Rassing who approached you? Was it someone? Was the owner? Was it someone on the coaching staff? It's basically done through like agent friends of mine. You know, in terms of the you know looking at teams who. I thought it would be cool to kind of look at really. Um, so obviously Racing, I would say is, you know, if not the best, has the best setup in the world probably. Um, and obviously now I've been there for nearly two months. You know, I see I see why. And obviously the big part of that is um, Jackie's, you know, his mindset and his love for the game, but also his um, business acumen as well, to be able to run it like a real business. Um, and also, he wants to win championships, you know. And he, the way he's doing it is with his family orientated. And um, you know, for me, family is everything. Um, just like my faith. And um, you know, I can I can see why they're going to be a successful team in years to come. And it's not like a, sh- a short term plan. It's it's real long. You know, it's it's going to go on for decades. So um, you know, you're only going to see great things happening for Racing you know, if not in the near future, um, if I have anything to do with it, but definitely in the long term. What was it like getting back involved? Like, obviously, there's physiological differences in the NFL and rugby, and the conditioning is completely different. But what were the, di- again, for like, for me, different sport, but I understand there'll be massive differences. So when you moved to the NFL running back, what did they want to change or alter? Obviously, you've got incredible talent, but what did they want to build on and apply? And then coming back to rugby, what are the things you've had to alter or change again, moving back into like a 15s cardiovascular, constantly running? What, what are the big differences that you've noticed? Yeah, so the first thing was they wanted to put size on um, because obviously with um, rugby, we're having to run for 80 minutes, you know, usually like at a constant pace. There's obviously some walking involved as well, but you're you're on the field in the action for 80 minutes. Um, whereas obviously in the NFL, you know, they need your skill at 100%, if not 110% for, you know, six to 10 seconds. And then you're going to get a 40 second rest. And so putting on size is something that would naturally happen anyway, because you're probably still going to eat the same amount you eat, if not a little bit more. Um, you're going to be obviously being doing a lot more explosive training, strength training, stuff that's going to make you bulletproof. Um, but then you're not going to have to, you know, you're not going to sweat as much or, sh- or shed as much weight as you would when you're, you know, like in a game of rugby, we'd be running, you know, six, seven, eight K in games um, and training probably four or five K and stuff. So it's one of those ones where, you know, if I, I'm trying to remember, I'll probably be running about two K in like NFL training sessions. So you're not running as far. But like those 2K are like high speed meters, all of them, <laughs> probably most of them, you know. And saying that, is going one way to NFL and not having to do like the nasty cardiovascular, which is my least favorite part of rugby training, <laughs> quite nice, right? Putting on bulk and like explosive power, explosive training, I really enjoyed. Mm. And then coming back to rugby, has that been really hard, almost starting from nothing and having to build that back in? Because it's one of the hardest bits to build into your, to your physical side. Yeah, I think, like, I enjoyed, obviously, like you say, going into NFL because it's like you get to do all the cool stuff, the stuff that everybody likes, the glamorous stuff, um, and then the stuff that actually looks cool when you're in the game. So, like, you know, scoring or making a, a break, make, you know, breaking somebody's ankles, making people miss. That's all, like, the explosive, like, speed work stuff. Um uh, and then even like, you know, jumping to catch a ball or diving to catch a ball and stuff like that. 
if you're if you're in the um, open field and you're running as a receiver or a slot receiver. Um, but funny enough, I was a bit worried as well coming back into rugby because I've been doing training that uh, anaerobic like system, you know, for four years. Coming back, I was like, oh, it's gonna be like hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, we. We actually don't really do fitness tests at all in the NFL. The only we had our only cardio test was like um travel what they call them now. It's crazy. Uh it's crazy. But basically we'd run from um sideline to sideline and back. So it was like over and back. Um you had to do it in sixteen seconds. So they they basically say you don't let the clock hit seventeen seconds. So you had up to sixteen point nine nine to get over and back. And the field is 53 yards wide. So it's basically like 100, let's just call it 110, 110 yards in 17 seconds. So you, you basically 100 meters in 17 seconds, it's not very fast, right? So you, you can do that. that. Yeah. Mate, you can do that <laughs> quicker than you can do your first Bronco when you get back yeah. into Rasa. You'd be like, what, what have I changed back for? Exactly. So it's like over and back in this uh, rolling clock. Basically, you do that, and then you get 40 seconds rest and go again. And there's no down-ups, you know what I mean? There's no down-ups. <laughs> just put on a line, go there and back. And you have to do that times 10. And I remember the first time I did it, I was just like, oh, how many sets are we doing? And we got to, like, rep six, seven. And it was like, oh, just one. I was like, okay. Oh, let me not <laughs> I can do this. Anything more. Because you know how it, it usually is. You, the more talking you do, the more rep sets they're going to throw in. But... <laughs> Yeah, it was just one set, and that was our like cardio, um, or should I say, our fitness test on day one of training camp. Um, and I was just like, oh, that's sweet. But you, do, to be honest, when you're training that different system, it catches up with you. You get to about rep seven or eight, and you do feel your lungs a little bit. It's nothing crazy, but you know, you do kind of have to work up to it, which is uh, it's quite nuts. And then obviously, as you are heavier, so the quarterbacks would do it, have 18 seconds, and then the heavies, they would have it, they would have 20 seconds to do it. And basically, if you didn't complete that, then you have to keep doing it until you could complete the test and get it under the seconds. But, you know, most people did it on day one. You talk about how much size you put on when you went to the NFL. Do you know how much you've lost since you came back to rugby? Do you know how much weight you've lost? Yeah, so I mean, funny enough... <clears throat> When I left rugby, I was probably like 85 kg, 84 maybe. Um, and then when I went over to the NFL, I put on about 6 kg, 6, 7 kg. So I was like 200 pounds, um, which is about 90 kg, 90, 91. And then um, when I obviously got, did my shoulder, I lost a lot of weight, obviously. And then... Um, I probably went down to about 82, 81. And then obviously now I'm back up to like 85. So it's kind of weird, like because of the injury, it obviously enabled me to, I guess, down-regulate the way I've been training and then build it back up with the new energy system now I want to use. So I guess it kind of, you know, worked out. Mate, what I liked earlier was you are talking about earlier being blocked from being the best version of yourself that you wanted to be. And that was what pushed you to move it to the NFL. And like, I've had conversations like weirdly with a teammate of yours, with Richie Gray. So oh, Richie yeah. Gray, who you toured with the Lions on 2000, 2013. Like I remember played for Scotland together, but chatting to him and he'd had like pipe dreams of like, cause he's a really talented athlete, like a freak for how big he is. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, I reckon I could... I reckon I could try out and make it as a tight end, but like, I wouldn't want anyone to know. I wouldn't want to lose my contract. I wouldn't want to lose the security, Yeah. but yeah. you did all that. Yeah, you yeah. basically, you forego, you came to the end of your contract and said, I don't need my this many thousand pounds coming from wasps. I'm going to go and try this NFL and try something different because I believe myself and I want to do it. And you're the 1% of rugby players that physically could do it. And then probably the 1% that mentally had the fortitude to try and do it as well. So I wanted to go back to the start where, you said that you were blocked from being the best version of yourself. And what was it you felt about rugby or the environment that you're in that capped you? And how was the process of realizing, actually, I think I could do NFL and I could give this a go and then putting it into 
putting it into action? Like, wh- where were those points in time for you? Um, and how did it all come around? You know, just working my way through, you, ha- you know, you have your selection issues and stuff like that. But as a kid, you're just like, you know, you're just going to keep going hard, keep trying, do what you can. You know, I used to work with Julian Golden, who's a close friend of uh, the family, you know, ex-Commonwealth, ex-Olympic champion. Um, speed work, different stuff like that. And I've just always wanted to, like, you know, just be the best I can be for myself because that's what you hear a lot of the time. But then as I got older and was getting better at the sport, um, you know, I I had a few coaches who really invested in me, but then I also had other coaches who, you know, it was a bit of a weird situation where I probably wasn't getting coached, but, you know, I was being used to score tries or um, sometimes not being used and not knowing why. Um, And I think just ultimately I got to a point where I had enough experience I played with a lot of different players um, and, uh, you know, the way that I was able to get better was just through talking to, like, players and working with them rather than with coaches because, you know, it was only, like, at the time, maybe two or three coaches who really, you know, invested in me or actually coached me, which I couldn't really understand, you know, because you want to be, you want to be the best, you need to be coached. You need the the coaches should be wanting to invest in the players in the team, and um, it just felt like it was it was something else, you know, a lot of the time, and especially if you're the star player or you're scoring a lot of tries, you know, surely you'd want to work with those players to help them get to the next level and keep. When I say the next level, I mean the next level of performance, not the next level in terms of playing for England and all the other stuff, because. You know, growing up, I really cared about that stuff. But then when it got to 2015, I kind of just washed my hands of it because it was just like, I feel like you play rugby in England. All anybody cares about is playing for England. But everybody's going to play for England. You know, I've got one cap. Most most people who play in the Premiership have probably got a cap. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't mean a lot. Um, And it might be just because of the experience I've had, but... I'm sure there's a loads of other people I speak to who've had a similar experience where they just kind of haven't understood why or what's really been going on. And then we're not the best team in the world. And then it just kind of begs to differ. Like what, what's the real kind of um, the aim of English rugby, you know? And um, for me, if it's, if we have coaches who just coach and make players better, have people that have, you know, teach people about mindset, want to um, actually develop their mind, develop their gameplay and teaching them the, how to play the game. It could really help to elevate um, our sport as in general. No, but it's, I mean, it's really interesting when you look at what's happening and we'll talk about Wasps and, and other clubs in a minute, but just in general, when you look at our sport and the state of the game and what's happened with Worcester and Wasps and potentially... Ellie Giltini's bad news coming out of there as well, potentially the next few days, a different model in America, but more generally the culture. What do you think that we can look at and take from American football and apply to rugby globally that's going to help us? You've mentioned their mindset, coaching, development, individual personal development aspects, but there must be many more things that you've seen and felt and been exposed to now that you think could help take rugby to another level. You know, my biggest thing, I've actually just set up my a foundation called uh, Next Gen U. And, like, the slogan is, like, feel good, play good, game ready, right? And the way I see it is I didn't grow up in, like, a private school um, or around money and stuff like that. I'm from a working class. You know, I saw, you know, I see rugby as a sport that can change lives the way it's changed mine and so many others. But there is just, like, some stuff in the sport which... You know, it doesn't make sense. Usually, if it doesn't make sense, you know, there's, there's probably some other stuff going on, right? But, you know, it's not for me to kind of go into that. Ultimately, I think that rugby is a great game that should be played across the world. Um, it's still very much in the private school kind of sector. I think if you open it up and start to look at the sport and how it can help change people, help may have an influence on people, and that's everybody you know, that the sport would then start to thrive. You know what I mean? I think that's part of the issue, um, you know, starting from the ground up. But if you look at American sports, 
you know, it's amazing to see. I spent some time with a good friend of mine, John Brown. He used to play for the Baltimore Ravens, started off at Arizona Cardinals, and then ultimately ended up, ended up with the Bills, the Raiders, and then Tampa Bay um, with Tom Brady as well. So he's had, you know, eight, nine, ten years as an NFL athlete. And he's he started off his little league team, which is like a flag football team. And, you know, you've got like five, six-year-olds already acting like professionals. And some people will say, oh, you know, that's not good. But it's just like, no, they're, they're actually having fun, but they're just being taught the fundamentals and being coached how to catch the ball properly, you know. So they're like little professionals when they're playing, but they're still kids. And they'll be in the house running around using footwork on me. And I'm like, yo, this is, this is nuts. But, you know... If you if the sport wasn't widely open to everybody, you know you're gonna miss out on a pool of of kids and, and and ultimately a pool of professionals that could help elevate the game because of well you know I'm not sure what the reason is but you know it's just small things like that so obviously with my foundation I obviously want to like you know use the private schools because they they have the um, they have the guys who already play the game and, you know, hopefully mix them, those guys with other guys who maybe haven't played or who would like to play, you know, to all, so everyone's coming together. So then you have a nice mix of, um, you know, people who are keen to play rugby, who actually want to learn, you know, and ultimately that's the whole, you know, feel good, play good game ready, you know, bringing a different culture to it. You know, I have live music at my um, camps. You know, my younger brother's a drummer. Um, you know, I have, have music, you know, little dance-offs and stuff. There's there's a nice little, you know, couple of little stuff that I do in there, all with a professional aspect, just so that people can see rugby in a different light, you know, so that they when they come, it's not like, oh, this is the same, same old, like, rugby, rugby, rugby. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just a game played by kids which eventually gets changed and it becomes about something else. And then people are chasing after stuff like Richie, you know, with Richie Gray, he, he wants to do this, but he has a security and, you know, it's, it's, it's a game that, you know, it can do wonders, but, you know, there's something that happens in between where you either come out of the other end and have it with a positive light or you come out with a negative light. And I think that, you know, you'll see in America that regardless of when the guys make it to the NFL, the NBA, um, the NHL, whatever, they always come out with a positive life. You know what I mean? Like some of the best days of my life. College ball is amazing. I got to do this. I got to do that. You know, you'd think they played in the NFL for 10 years. And it's just like, you know, in rugby, it's not always that way. And I think that, you know, we there's, there's lots that can be done. The, you know, the potential is massive. You know, it's a game that I love. It's a game that's changed my life and changed many people's life, like I said. But, you know, it needs to kind of be delivered differently, I think. And obviously hearing you speak about that, you're obviously very passionate about that. And it, it seems like you've got a, a, a much more positive outlook on rugby. Now you're obviously back in the sport and hopefully you've got a good few years to come. It really positively giving to the sport and the sport giving to you but you did mention back there that in 2015 you sort of washed your hands of the whole England thing it didn't seem like a very positive in environment for you and you mentioned as well sort of being given a lot of maybe excuses or reasons that you didn't quite understand about why you weren't being picked in certain environments particularly with England so I remember hearing you as well say at one point I think you were you ignored a call because you were just like, I know what it's going to be. I know exactly what's going to be said. So it's just going back to, to then it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? When you're in that environment, you're scoring tries for fun and you're still not getting to that level that you think you deserve to be at. So what was that like at the time? I mean, it's quite frustrating. You know, you, you feel the top tries for the league consistently for eight years or whatever it was, um, it, you know, I don't really know what, you know what I'm saying? If, you, if you're if you in the NBA, you're top top point scorer, you're going to be being rep representing your country. You're going to be in, you're going to have like, people who want to work with you to like, see if you could get better or, you know, if you suggest to do something to try and elevate your game, you know, 
you you would expect people to want to like help do that stuff but you know it would be like oh almost like oh you i'm at my peak so you can't get any better it was, that's the kind of vibe i would get and it's just like well obviously it's not good enough because i'm not getting picked so you know i'm i'm of this that's how i'm wired i want to be the best and if i'm not playing for england then i'm obviously not the best you know what i mean i don't need to be like oh I'm the best, I'm doing this and whatever, like I should be being picked. If I'm not being picked, then I'm obviously not good enough. So I want to be better. You know, who who can I go to to help coach me? Um, you know, not, it wasn't really anybody in the rugby world. Um, so I would then seek my own coaches, do my own training, which helped to maintain the level I could play at. Um, it might not maintain my, it might not give me the skills that people maybe wanted me to have or maybe think I didn't have. Um, but it definitely was, you know, enabled me to put the performances out there, which kept people on the edge of their seats, which kept me, you know, having the stats I would have. Um, and then, like I said, when I did have coaches that came along, like Rob Hoadley, Brad Davis, um, you know, Sean Edwards, Ben Ryan, you know, then at, at those times, that's when my game did go up and elevate. But other than that, I was just relying on talent, you know, and, you know, great players who I was able to play with to help teach me, you know, if you, anybody I play with, you will know, like, yeah, where he's always trying to, like, learn, he come and speak to me about this and watch, you know, watch video with guys, like, watch other sports as well, seeing what I can learn, because I'm, I'm literally like a sponge, but I just feel, you know, in my career that there's so many opportunities for me to have got taken my game to another level but it just wasn't, there's was no resource for it, you know? And some of those coaches you mentioned there in terms of the ones that had a real positive effect on you were defence coaches, Sean Edwards, best defence coach we've ever seen. Brad Davis, really respected in that world. At that time when you were getting frustrated, and I don't know what the excuses or the, the reasons that people were giving you in terms of England selection were, but I have heard you talk about it in the past that there was a lot of kind of, I suppose you describe it as lazy journalism at the time, sort of saying, well, Christian scores tries for fun, but his defence is like this or that. And, and it, it almost felt like that was a frustration for you because you felt that was an area that you worked on and you'd improved and, and it was good, but it was almost like people didn't have to watch carefully what you were doing. They'd just go to that. Oh, that's why he's not getting picked because of that. Yeah, well, you know, it's the media. So it's just like media don't know what they don't know. Um, and there is... No one really knows anyway, because from England coaches, it, the, those weren't and the reasons I would get, you know, wouldn't there wouldn't really be any reasons. Uh, it just wouldn't happen for me. So ultimately, to, can, can, to keep the story going, people had to report on something. So that's obviously they would just go for those things, you know. But, um, you know, after, after a while, you know, I was just kind of like, you know, it was frustrating, but I never really read uh, media stuff anyway, it's just what people would say. And then I think I spoke about it before with, with Brad Davis. He actually was like, no, let me actually pay attention to this and have a look, and analyze my game, look at past videos. And he was just like, you're actually one of the best defenders in the league for your position. Um, and so-and-so who's playing for England misses X amount of tackles, this, that, is like, you know, ninth, tenth in the league. So, you know, just continue to ignore that stuff. We'll keep working because he knows the type of player I play I am. And, um, you know, I just go from strength to strength. Now, when it comes to defence, like, you know, or at, at the time then, and obviously going forward, I was, you know, I could help to communicate, help other people around me so that they could be better defenders, you know, be able to read the game well, track the ball in defence. I love defence, you know, so it's, it's one of those things. Obviously, I'm never going to be the dude to like make big crunch and tackles like all the time because of my size. But at the end of the day, you know, tackles a tackle, you know, as long as you do your job, that's all that matters. You know what I'm saying? But aside from that, you know, who's going to score the same amount of tries I can score? Who's going to be the person that when the game is up against the wall or we've got our backs, who are you looking for in the field? You know what I mean? Those are the things that when it comes to a game, because that's what it is at the end of the day. If you want to win, those are the things you're looking for. Who's got X factor, like who can do all the things and, you know, still bring that X factor when it's needed. Um, 
because that's when you see the true character of players, right? When there's adversity or there's discomfort, you know, who can still perform, who can still apply the pressure, even when the pressure's been on them the whole game. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been a journey, mate. It's been a journey, but uh, you know, it's definitely... It's, it, like I said, you know, I've had the experience of all the rugby stuff at all the levels up to Lions. And then I've been to America for four years with one of the best teams in the league as well. As you can see, they're still getting better and better. And um, I'm still in contact with a lot of the guys. Josh Allen, you know, um, Levi Davis, now moved to a different team. Zach Moss, or all the running backs, Motor Singletary. You know, Tyrell, there's, there's so many players, you know, across the league, not just at the Bills, that, um, you know, their mindset matches mine. And that's why when I went there, I felt so comfortable. Um, and it just, you know, helped take me to another level in my mindset as well. Because I was just like, you know, all these years in rugby thinking that I'm the odd one out. And, you know, why does anyone else think how I think? You know, I'm, is there something wrong with me? going to there and just feeling absolutely at peace and saying, oh, this is why, because, you know, I, I, I'm an elite, an elite professional and I need to be around people who think the same. Otherwise, I'm going to be uncomfortable um, and not in a good way, you know. Not, it's not the, the, the uncomfortable, it's not the living in the uncomfortable so that you, you know, sorry, it's not being comfortable in the uncomfortable environments where you're working hard, it's the uncomfortable because it's it's like a thorn in your side. Like, you know, you don't want that thorn in your side. You want to take it out because it's just an annoyance. You know, we're trying to get somewhere. You know, what can we do to get this to this point? You know, rather than just kind of resting on our laurels. Now, I mean, I think it's it's much harder to be that type of driver, and we talk about. The people that are uncomfortable when it's comfortable, those are your leaders and your drivers and the people that want to drive change. Um, and Sean Edwards is probably a good example of exactly that. Like you mentioned Tim and Brad Davies um, a little bit earlier. Um, and like mentioning those guys, we have to mention your old club um, as a former Wasp player and somebody who did so much for the club and scored so many tries and the club having done so much for you. What do you make of everything that's happening at the moment? Have you spoken to teammates, next teammates and checked in? What do you make of all? I haven't, I mean, I've spoken to a couple of teammates, um, but a lot of the guys uh, who were teammates of mine have already left. Um, so I haven't been able to speak to, you know, the guys who are still there that are, that I played with. Um, uh, I've, I've spoken to Ashley Johnson, um, Bialo, who's kind of just joined there. And um, today I was just catching up with uh, one of the younger guys, Gabriel Ogre as well. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's extremely sad to be honest. I don't really know. It's hard to find words, you know, because I know we was in a similar position before Derek Derek Richardson came on, you know, and Steve Hayes was um, had a meeting with us and saying, you know, he's looking to sell us, and if we don't find a buyer, we could go to admin. And, you know, issues with being paid late and stuff like that. Um, so it's, 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 I, I remember, I, I'm familiar with the, the feelings at around the time, but um, from what I'm hearing, the guys uh, who had obviously been through it before didn't think that this would actually happen because we, we came out of it last time, you know, and was is such a, a strong brand, a strong club. It's been around for years, you know. Um, you know, it's just it's just sad that it basically is, you know, in the position it is now, you know. Um, but the, with COVID and stuff, even if someone wanted to come in and save the club, I feel as though maybe the, the, the situation with the economy right now as well, it's just too risky, right? But, um, you know, on the flip side, it's like, but you've got, you know, 40 plus players who now don't have a job, which is it's absolutely crazy to me. Um, you know, I just don't really, it's hard to like fathom, you know, what, 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 what would be like if I was in that position right now, which could easily have been a situation for me. 
um, you know, what, what, what would I do right now? You know, it's, uh, it's a hard, it's a hard pill to swallow, even though I'm not, I'm not there, you know, cause I know so many guys that have been there, some of the guys that are there. And I mean, I went in to see the boys, um, in preseason this year, actually. So I was, I saw a lot of the you know staff members who were still there and, you know, I was happy to see them, happy to see me. It's been four or five years. And just to think that, you know, now they don't have jobs. It's, it's just, it's crazy. I was going to mention you going in in pre-season, actually. Did, was there a time when you thought you might go back there? What, did you come close to coming back? Obviously, it's a blessing now that you, you didn't give in everything that's that's yeah. unfolding. But there were a lot of rumours at the time and you did go in and, and see them. So that, was that something that could have happened? <laughs> I mean, there's always the potential for stuff, but to be honest, I wasn't really looking to go back there. Um, you know, the Midlands life's not really for me. And with the, the stuff that I've got going on off the field, um, you know, I was looking more at different different areas of England. Um, and then also looking at, like I said, you know, from my point of view, what I was trying to achieve in terms of the motivation to want to play rugby again. And to take my game to, or to continue to learn, you know, I'm not just trying to go to work so I can collect a salary every month, you know, because, um, you know, it's it's just not that's just not been one of my main drivers. But um, it, you know, like I said, it could it still could have been an option. You're still only 31, mate, which is ridiculous. You're still a young man. <laughs> so what is it that you would like to achieve? Like if you set out a uh... Like those clubs weren't right for you. This is what I'd like to achieve. What does the future look like? If you could plan that, what are you hoping to achieve over the next two, three seasons? Well, to be honest, I, won't, I have not been able to win like any major championships. You know, I've been in finals. Um, I've been in semifinals. Um, and then in sevens, you know, more, more of the same really. Um, so my my main thing is, you know, I, like I said, I want to take my game to another level because I still feel like if I could have, you know, like a coach like a, no Brad Davis, um, I forgot I didn't I forgot to mention like my uh, under 18s coaches as well, like John Fletcher and uh, Peter yeah. Walton, and those two um, as well. They definitely took help helped me with my development in the early years. Uh, Mark Mapletoff. Um, I've had some great coaches, and I could tell you that. A couple of great coaches in the early days, but, um, you know, if I could have, like, a coach that I could work with, you know, I just I just, I just, just have this burning desire to, like, really, like, like want to understand rugby. Because I went to America for, for three, was playing for three years, and, like, to be to, the, the, the amount of detail and, like, learning the game and stuff, and then coming back to rugby, I'm like, do I even really know rugby that well? You know what I mean? Like, it makes me question, like, yeah, I've been able to do great stuff and play with some great teams, but, like, do I even really know this game that well or understand it? Because the detail that we've been going into in the NFL, I'm like, I could talk to you about NFL for hours and hours. I mean, like, I could probably do that with rugby, but probably not in the same amount of detail, which is just, it's kind of crazy. Clearly, the setup there is really professional. It's suiting you down to the ground at the moment. It is are you seeing yourself there for the long term in Paris with wrestling, or is it just for the rest of the season and then see what happens? I mean, it's yeah, it's really like see what happens and stuff because you know I'm just coming fresh out of retirement. Um, you know, there's I've only signed obviously for one year, um, and so obviously I want to see if I can still, you know, see if it's still possible to achieve those stuff. Because although I'm obviously going to push for it, you know, there's still going to be, um, it's not all down to me, you know. So hopefully um, in terms of, you know, the stuff I want to achieve, you know, I would like to stay at Racing um, because of the setup they have. And like I said, they've got a great uh, owner, some good people there as well. Um, so that would obviously be amazing. But, um, you know, it's still a business as well. So we'd have to wait and see what happens over the, you know, the course of the season. Um, but yeah, ultimately, uh, being in France is, is, is pretty good. Um, but there are other options as well. As I was saying before, you know, I was able to kind of go to the different markets just to see 
what the situation was. Um, so yeah, we'll just you know I'll just take it week by week, really, um, which is kind of, kind of how I'm how I'm wired now as well. I'm actually wired day by day because in the NFL, you know, like you know, you can get the call at any moment. Um, so it's not even week to week or like year to year. Like in rugby, you can get real comfortable. You know, I'm like, you know, every session, like, I want to do something. You know, I want to do this, I want to do that. There's no, you can't wait for the weekend. You can't wait for, all right, next week or next month. It's like, nah, you need to do something now. Otherwise, you could be gone. And this is the least day-by-day question ever. But I was going to say, obviously, Racing do have Stuart Lancaster coming in as head coach next season. Yeah. And he gave you your England cap. Um, yeah. You obviously worked with him he may have also been one that gave you reasons why he wasn't picking you as well. But how would you look at that in terms of him coming in next season? Loads of water to go under the bridge before then, but is he something that you, someone that you would look forward to working under again? Oh yeah, no, for sure. Like you said, like he was someone that, well, he's the only one that gave my chance at England, you know, before him, I think it was Martin Johnston. And, you know, I was just coming through the ranks at that point. Um, then Stuart was Stuart came in. I think he was like interim for a little bit, and they gave him like the the main job, and he gave my chance on that as well. I was doing the sections. Well, actually, my first year I went to the big South Africa tour in 2011, which was amazing. You know, just to be with those guys and playing midweek games was amazing. Then the sorry 2012 um, was the 11 12 season. Then the fall, yeah. Then the following year is when. Um, he took me on to the Argentina tour. I had my first cap. And, um, you know, now he he definitely was a coach. Although it's like England, that was a bit different, you know, with them every day. But um, my game definitely elevated underneath that, the style of play and how, you know, the skills that we used to do. And, you know, he even, you know, opened up, like, the England uh, facility. He was like, you know, if there's anything you guys need, let us know. And we'll see what we can do to help you with speed and all this stuff. So he was definitely a, like a revolutionary coach for England, I would say. Um, and um, he, you know, I wouldn't necessarily get excuses from him. You know, it would just be who, you know, we're going to go with this guy or whatever, which was fine. And then, you know, I got hurt. Um, but he's probably the only person who brought me back into camp. Because uh, even though I was injured, which I was very grateful for as well, just to feel like I was still part of the team. And then um, after that was kind of like the World Cup year. Well, actually, I got injured again. I was out for the whole season. So it was tough, you know. He, he, had, he had me in and around the squad the whole time he was involved, which for me meant a lot. Especially, It probably means, it probably means a lot more now than it did at the time as well, where, you know... You know, someone with a, a high pressure job, you know, you've got a lot of guys to look at. Um, but I mean, ultimately, 2015 kind of put a nail in the coffin for me as well. Though, when I might not have had the best season after being out for a year, uh, but I was still able to, you know, achieve some great stuff. And then I, fin- I finished off the year scoring a hat trick against the Barbarians. And then to be told, in essence, that you're not one of the top six wingers in the country. I was just like, mate, you know, this is, now I know that there's there's other stuff going on and there's no point me trying to push to play for a team that's obviously not pushing for greatness, you know what I mean? And that's where my um, motivation moved to just trying to be the best that can play, that the best, the best ring in the league because if I focused my attention and energy on England, that was going to bring me down, you know what I mean? And like I said, you know, it's not about England, it's not about your club, it's about the game of rugby and how it inspired me, how it's inspired other people and changed my life. And that's really what's enabled me to be motivated all the time and keep going because, you know, everybody's human. And so I don't put my trust in people as such, you know, I put it in the game of rugby and what it can do for people. And, you know, I then control my destiny at that point, you know, which is to enjoy it, to be the best and to have fun. 
and your focus obviously shifted after that 2015, but then Eddie Jones came in. So did you have conversations with him subsequently as, as well or not? Or was that very much you'd kind of park that? I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't really know Eddie Jones, like, at all, to be honest, you know. I think he had me come into, like, a mini camp one time for, like, a week. Um, I, can't, I can't really remember, it's, like, such a long time ago, but, yeah, I, he, he's just a bit of a, just a bit, just a different guy, you know, just a different guy, um, yeah, it's just, just a different dude, you know. But obviously, he's had some success in the years. And then obviously, he did pretty well with England so far. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, I, I mean, I don't really watch England games and stuff like that. You know, last four years, obviously, I've been away. Um, prior to that, like I said, my attention was more on other stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't really answer. I don't really know. I don't really know. <laughs> And go back to Stuart, Johnny, Stuart Lancaster, obviously coming into to wrestling. That was really interesting what Christian said there, because when you talk about the kind of coach that, that you want, Christian, to sort of elevate your game to another level, from everything that the players in Leinster say at the moment, that could well be Stuart Lancaster. So when I heard the news that he was coming, you know, some guys were like, oh, like, you know, the, you know, the one that didn't pick you, I was just like, man, like, it is what it is. Like, I'm not... I've never got, like, he asked any coach, like, I don't, if I don't get picked, I don't get in a stroke about it, you know. Like I said, I use it to, like, get better some more because obviously I'm not good enough, right? So that's just, just kind of how I push it. It was never like, well, yeah, I know I'm good, like, I'm not going to do this. You know, I just go keep working, keep working harder. So, um, you know, if, if not even if, I think I, it was rumours before if, but now it's confirmed. You know, if I was, if I'm at wrestling, um, I think it would be amazing obviously to work with him again because um, yeah like I remember I think it was his first year at Leinster actually um, we went and played them in the semi-final and they beat us but you know just the way that he had you know brought Leinster back to the top because they weren't doing as well before that and we used to like beat them every year um, well, well we had some good contests but we I think we we had beat them like three out of the four times, but um, you know that that year we went over there. It was a different team, and um, you know I know that he would have been a big reason for that as well because you know even if you look at England when Stuart was in, involved, we weren't very, we were we were very low in the rankings, and when he came in, we started to the style of rugby we played was good. You know we started seeing some younger guys like myself come through and. He basically birthed the England team that we, you know, saw Ed Joe kind of take on the last, on that long winning streak, you know, players like Maro. I remember being in the Saxon squad with him and, you know, that's all Stuart. So, you know, it would be very exciting to work with him again, but it's sport and, you, you know, you never know what's, what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, we'll have to just wait and see. And obviously you've given us so much detail on so many different subjects, but just going back to, the one strand that runs throughout everything you've said, which is your motivation is always to better yourself and you go for the challenge and you want the biggest challenge and to make the biggest success of yourself. Going to the NFL is one thing and achieving what you managed to achieve there. I wonder if there's a little bit of frustration that you didn't achieve, I'm sure, more, which is what you wanted to achieve and, and why you think that that was if it's just too tough to crack when you haven't started playing American football when you're about three years old. Um, but also this challenge of coming back to rugby, moving to Paris, taking it up again, is this an even bigger challenge? I mean, I think with the, with the NFL stuff, it was always going to be like a tough mountain to climb. But I think that in all honesty, it's, um, it's, it's always going to be hard for, 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 for people who haven't been through the system or have been involved with American sports to like really understand like the intricacies of it because you know to get to be at a team is like that is the goal rather than to make a 53 or to play games as such and the reason I say that is because you know let's take England for instance if you don't play for England then you know, what happens, okay, you're not getting paid as much for your club, you're not getting paid the money 
per game. You're not getting the extra money for commercial stuff. You're not getting any endorsements and stuff because club games don't get this. So that's why you want to play for England, right? With the NFL, whether you're a head coach, like a position coach, the PR girl or the PR guy, you know, there's a job for everybody and everybody in America wants to play or, should I say, be involved in the NFL in any capacity, whether it's a player or, or a staff, just like the NBA and the other sports. So the goal is to just have the badge or to represent the badge. You see what I mean? So for me, to be in the NFL for three and a half, four years, you know, that was the dream. That was the goal. And then anything else would have been a bonus, right? Um, obviously, I want to make a 53. But then you have to look at, you know, I have no history in America in terms of, you know, film, in terms of having a high school coach, college, a college career, because that's really what basically decides what your NFL career is going to look like. Because, you know, we've just like with anything, relationships is how you, you know, get opportunities. And for me, I was lucky enough that my talent gave me the opportunities to, first of all, be able to represent the NFL badge and a Bills badge for, you know, more than two years, which is the average career of an NFL athlete. So I had two contracts, which is, you know, I give God thanks for that. But then also to actually get the opportunity to play in preseason, which people say people look at that like, oh yeah, you just played preseason. Like you have to realize that if you if you can't be trusted to play, they're not you don't you don't actually play in preseason. So there's players who will be in the squad who've done training camp and stuff like that, who won't see a single snap in preseason. No matter who you are, like for me to go over there and then actually get to play a whole game for the last game and then get a snap in the first game with some of the first team players and the second game. Then they didn't play me the third game because I was actually like a credible, you know, like athlete out there, which if I played all four games and I made big plays in all four games, then now it becomes political because if they don't sign me to their 53 man squad, then any other team can come and collect me and put me on their 53 man squad during, during the waivers, which is a 24 hour period where anybody can take whoever's left who isn't being made 53. So, you know, these are all the things that people, unless you're in America, you have to understand how it works. So for me, I, I lived my dream. I was able to go to the NFL, score 68 yard touchdown, my first touch and then make a 48 yard, you know, receiving like breaking, you know, unfortunately my rugby instincts kind of took over when I should have run straight. So I would have had two touchdowns, but we don't like to talk about shoulda, woulda, couldas and stuff like that. But, you know, for me, I reached my goal. The opportunities I was given, just like always in my career, I take them and I, I, I do the best I can. And, um, you know, after that preseason, the following year came, COVID hit. So, uh, you know, there was no preseason. Then my last year, you know, I got hurt. So I was, you know, I was unable to play because I was having surgery. So it's just, um, you know, it's a shame. But, you know, with, with the with the racing stuff now, I don't think it's as a bigger challenge as that. Um I think really now, like I said, it's really just looking at, you know, seeing how I can elevate my game at this age, knowing that there isn't many coaches out there who really are about their stuff when it comes to, you know, elevating players like myself. Um, you know, that's where the challenge will come. But like I said, you know, as I've come this far, and, um, you know, if I can't get it from coaches, I've always been able to lean on players. And I've got, I'm not sure of, you know, world-class players at Racing. So, you know, you've got Finn Russell, the magician, you know, we call him Finn Marshall, uh, you know, Benji Marshall. But then you've got Warwick <laughs> Um, you know, even some of the young guns. You see, I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, he's, he's a young pup, can't learn from him. Absolutely. And... Before we sign off, on a lighter note, you mentioned him there, Finn Russell. I'm sure there's lots of people helping you said, 
settle in generally in Paris at the training ground off the field who's helping you settle in and has Finn shown you the highlights yet of Paris yeah, yeah there's Finn for sure he's been there what four or five years now um some of the forwards um Sidat Gonsa um Hassan uh Colin yeah um you know, I've been I've been to dinner with those guys and Gail as well. Actually, we had like a back dinner as well with all of us the other day. Um, I think um, Dimitri invited himself, but he's not a back. <laughs> 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 uh, I love I love Dimi though. He's he's awesome. Um, who else? Um, I mean, me and Work are pretty close. You know, as the fullback wing combinations anyway. Um, we're always having little conversations. Um, but to be honest, you know, being married now, you know, the wife comes first and stuff. We just had, you know, a couple of nights, a um, couple of dinner dates. But ultimately, the main thing has been trying to, you know, get our house and everything sorted out. Um, and to be honest, with, with Racing as well, they have such a great setup. You know, we have like a sports coordinator who's been very helpful with a lot of the stuff, you know. Um, you know, any anything to do with house and cars, um, you know, logistics as well with like sorting out the hotel for the few weeks that we was here to begin with, helping finding the house, you know. Um, I think I said that, yeah, helping find the house. Um, any medical stuff, like, so it's, it's, there is quite a lot of support, which is, you know, I, it's what I'm used to now, you know what I mean? Before I went to the NFL, I wouldn't wouldn't have been used to that um and i would have and it was like oh this is like crazy like mind blowing but that's how i felt when i went to the nfl so then coming back you know now it's kind of like oh this is awesome that like, they have we have this here as well because you know i wouldn't have expected this because i know this was almost like you know levels up from you know what you usually get in a rugby world so i think you know Rass like i said racing definitely have you know the right mentality about how to take care of players um how to um enable us to focus on the main thing so that we you know there's as less distractions as, as possible so uh and i think it's great and it should make a rule um that if you want to own a rugby team you have to be a billionaire otherwise <laughs> otherwise get out. you need it yeah <laughs> i think i think it's it's a fair rule to be honest because there is it's not cheap, you know what I mean? And we, we basically, a lot of teams try to do it the cheap way. And it's like, mate, we're professional athletes. Like, you can't, there's no shortcuts. You tell us we can't take shortcuts, but then, you know, in rugby, there's just hella shortcuts. You know what I mean? It's a bit, it's a bit unbalanced. Then, you know, you're going to run into trouble, man. So, well, rugby, that one, that should be... <laughs> There you more go. billion more billionaires right yeah, no bad. more billionaires we can all agree on that and on the flip side of more billionaires the most interesting thing you said there christian i think johnny and i will both agree the wife comes first so we didn't talk about finn showing you the the high life in this club or that club maybe he's he's better off avoiding finn's pub crawl of paris no nah, finn, finn is uh expecting a, he is mate mm, yeah settled now he left that life a long time ago you know so he's you know what i mean he's he knows as well um that he's got to take care of the wife you know what i mean so there's not there hasn't been any of any any pub calls i mean i don't, i'm not really on the pub call stuff myself anyway you know if i am i'll save it for end of season once we won some silverware and stuff but you know i'm more of a chilled you know evening like jazz live music few drinks you know some good food you know what i mean i like the the good cuisine i mean there's plenty of different cuisines around in paris man like i'm only just realizing that there's like different quarters for like you know a latin quarter and italian quarter like all of it. i'm like mate this is this is pretty it's pretty cool man it's next level well you can take them for some jazz to help them wet the baby's head i'm sure you'll love that mate <laughs> bit of live music few yeah. drinks couple of whiskeys you love that yeah, you can yeah, sort yeah. that for him for real, for real. It's proper. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us, Christian. It's so good to hear you already immersed in the Parisian culture and loving life over there. And hopefully, like you say, some silverware at the end of this season. And then maybe we'll chat again next season when you're still there under Stuart Lancaster, hopefully. 
Yeah, hopefully, man. I mean, we'll, you know, it'll be it'll be awesome to still be here and stuff. Um, but like I said, you know, it's the business. You see, things change from year to year. Um, and I, I might be, I might. This might not be the attitude that obviously other rugby players have, but because I, I know I'm used to before signing like two, three years and stuff. But like I said, just being in the NFL now, it's just like you know, I'm more. I guess I'm more on the edge of my seat you know, pushing for greatness, but also, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. And I kind of like living in that space now as well. You're an experienced man now, day by day, day by day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, Christian. Thanks so much for joining us. Speak to you guys later. Thanks a lot, mate. Cheers. Thanks, guys. See you there. Obviously, great to have Christian on, Johnny. A deep thinker, uh, someone who has got a lot to say, a lot of different experiences. And mm -hmm. some of his takes were... Very interesting. Yeah, I think the fundamental one that I can align with him is that you do get a lot of crap coaches in rugby. That's not a, not a nice thing to say, but... He wasn't shy of saying that, was he? No, <laughs> but he, uh, what I like is that his, he's talented enough and he backs himself enough and he's got the mental fortitude not to let his life be dictated to by poor coaches or the choices made by one or two coaches along his career. And he's even changed his sport. Like, if you go through his CV... He touched on towards them, but premiership record try scorer for a period of time. Hat trick against the Babas. He ran in three tries past me in 2012. We all thought he was phenomenal, but then he didn't get any more caps. Went on to reach the pinnacle, so jumped England, played for British and Irish Lions, then decided to leave, went on the NFL international ID program to have the balls just to do that. But he's in the 1%, like I said right at the start, that would choose to do that, but then actually to work your way through it, earn a contract, Run in again, we didn't touch on it, but run in a 55 yard touchdown on your first touch in yeah. an NFL game. It's ridiculous. The stuff this boy has done is phenomenal. Now, almost now, age 31, for weirdly and different reasons, it's even harder. Like, he's not Gif to get on that roster and play and get the game time at Racing. Like, he's now on times against them, but the talent he has. And the mental side that he has, he's on a different level with what he's done, what his CV suggests. Um, and if he can stay at Racing, and if he can work with somebody like Stuart Lancaster, undoubtedly they get the best out of him. Um, but I just, I just enjoyed, like he talked at length. We didn't even have to talk much to him. Prepare, like it was just simple <laughs> yeah. questions. It's always but, better that way. Exactly. But for, for everyone listening back home, a completely different character, one that you're probably not used to hearing from at all. Um, but a real eye-opener into one of the world's best athletes and how they function, how they operate within a team sport, within two different team sports. Um, and so it was really interesting, totally diverse and not what we're used to, but I loved listening. Towards the end, I wasn't even asking questions. I was just listening. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely loved having him on and a real character. Right, we spoke a little bit about last weekend's action earlier on, but it's about time we found out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. Comes from Leon, mate which is surprising considering what I said about them last week. Um, but one heck of a week for Ethan Dumortier. Um, two tries against Montpellier and a huge win away from home. Impeccable in there where he took absolutely everything and made them look village. Um, and he created the third try with a 50-meter break himself. And he ended that all by being called up by Fabian Galtier for his first involvement in the French side. So amazing stuff for him. His performance and Leon is this week's meter moment of the week. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. And you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 20% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FrenchPod20 at checkout. That's FrenchPod20 and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. Before we go, Johnny, we should have a quick word again about transfers. It's all kicking off. Hey, what have you, what have mate, you heard? Mate, there's about a million. Um, look, what's happening at Wasps isn't helping, but you've got Alfie Barbieri already tipped to Bordeaux, Vincent Koch to Stade Francais, B. Allo, we didn't really ask we should have asked christian but potentially to racing yeah he mentioned he knew him good mate potentially to racing and also we mentioned toulon's fly half search maybe one there as well yeah so now looking like well again french press reporting dan bigger likely or the or the favorite club to take him will be racing i don't know what that means for finn russell but 
Jacob Umanga, tip to go to Toulon, Jack Nowell to Clermont or Racing, uh, Josh Tuasova to Racing with Kenny Lynn, the coach following him as well from Lyon, and potentially George Bridge to Montpellier. So look, the conveyor belt has started. There's so much going on. The agents aren't going to be shy of a bonus or two uh, for this year. But that's it. It's kicked off already. And you can you can tell as well, it's the, it's the cream of the crop. The middle market of people like me coming to France has kind of fallen away and gone. It's now your rock stars and nothing else. Um, so there's some big money being thrown about. Thanks, Johnny. A massive thanks to Christian Wade for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Fuck!